Hello everyone, welcome to the Microbiome Bioinformatics with Chime 2 Online Workshop. Today we're going to discuss phylogenetic reconstruction. My name is Mike Robeson. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in the Department of Bioinformatics, where I currently focus on the human microbiome. So grab a cup of coffee or your favorite beverage and let's uh, talk about trees. Many of, you, many of you are aware of the famous drawing by Charles Darwin called I Think, where he came up with the concept of a branching structure of species over time, or the variety of life as it goes extinct or diverges in creating new species over time. Hence the name of his book, Origin of Species. He was interested in how new taxa arrive over time. Now, what do we call this field of research? Well, phylogenetics. And if you break down the word phylogenetics, we're talking about the phylon or phyla, or in a sense, groups of things, whether they be tribes, clans, organisms, anything. So it's a collection of things, particularly in a population. And geneticos, which is the origin of source of those groups of organisms. So we're interested in the history of these groups over time. One of the foundational insights we've gotten in the field of microbial phylogenetics is this idea of the three domains of life discovered by Carl Rose and Fox. And what you see on the left is the phylogenetic structure or representation of the bacteria, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And on the right, you see Carl Rose, and he's over a light table where he's looking at these old gels with blotches. And we'll discuss a little bit of history of these gels and how he was able to come up with this third domain and what he did to investigate and derive that there might be a third domain of life. Now, in order to do this, in order to have characters that are meaningful in a phylogenetic sense, they have to be consistent. They have to be comparable in such a way that you can generate a sort of distance. The more different things are to one another, the more you should be able to quantify that difference. And he centered on the ribosomal or RNA molecule because he knew it was present in all microbes of interest that he was looking at. And he was able to look at differences in, of the, that molecule, the sequence of the molecule itself, and determine how similar or different these organisms were to one another. Well, how did he do this? Well, here's the only table or figure in the Rose and Fox 1977 paper in PNAS. And what this table is, it's a symmetrical matrix showing the similarity of representative eukaryota, bacteria, and archaea, which back then were known as archaeobacteria. And you can see right away, right, as it makes sense, eukaryotes are more similar to each other than they are to E. coli or other bacteria, and even more similar to each other than they are archaea. Now, this table is what he kind of used to derive this third domain or potential third domain at the time. And you can see right away, you can infer that, huh, interesting, the archaea seem to be a bit more similar to eukarya than they are to bacteria. And this is kind of the first table showing from a sequence point of view, a molecular point of view, the similarity of these domains to each other. Now, how did he do this? How did he generate that table? Well, there's a variety of ways to do this, but often researchers use two-dimensional gels. And depending on the migration rate in these two directions, they were able to piece together bits of sequence of the rRNA molecule itself. Note, they're, they're extracting the ribosomal rRNA 
directly. This is not DNA, they're sequencing, but the RNA, as evidenced by the uracil notation. So these are the nucleotides that they're using as a kind of a GPS marker to put the other blobs in, in reference to. So what do I mean by that? So through a variety of um, methods in the lab and restriction digests and whatnot, you can piece together the sequence data along these two dimensions. And initially you, you have a dot with a G, a uracil and guanosine, and uracil, uracil and guanine. And depending on how far they migrate directionally from that point, you can piece together the sequence. So let's say I have a dot right here. Well, that sequence, that blob is a GC. If I have a dot over here, then it's G A A C, right? Again, there's multiple ways to kind of generate these plots and piece things together. But over here, you could see an example where you're basically drawing circles. You know, you have an overlay on your gel and you write on it and you say, oh, this blob is AGAU, this blob is GAAU, AGAC, right? And you could annotate what fragments. So you could kind of think of this as a archaic form of shotgun sequencing a single rRNA molecule. Now, you couldn't really assemble the sequence. All you can do is figure out what characters or groups of letters together. In a sense, you could kind of view these as you would um, shotgun metagenome data, right? You could kind of think of these as kamers in a sense, which is in a sense what they did here. So you have a set of characters of a certain length, and you just mark down for each one of those gels, and you have one of those gels per organism, and you mark down whether that sequence was in that organism or not. You put a one or a zero. And this is basically a simple character matrix. And there's a lot of tools where you can take a character matrix and you derive a tree like this. And then you can infer the relationships of these organisms given the character states, or in this case, sequence states that you have. So you could kind of view this. I always like to view this as a a laboratory way of generating Kamer sequences. Uh, so what is old is now new again. Now I've just skipped several decades of sequencing technology improvements, but here's kind of where we are now uh, using more modern and multi-gene phylogeny and comparative genomics approaches where here's all of our eukaryotes, our various archaea, and then this big blob right here are the bacteria and the new bacterial clade, the candidate phylum radiation. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, okay, fine, I know who's related to who, but how does it actually help me? Well, there's a lot of things you can do. So let's say you do an uh, amplicon survey or a shotgun metagenome survey, or maybe you have other data that you can construct a phylogeny of. Well, you still may not have enough information about the molecule, or sorry, the organism, to know what it really is. But based on the phylogenetic proximity of that novel organism to things that you know, you might be able to infer things about it. Maybe it's a pathogen and you want to know, well, how closely related is this bacteria to other pathogens? And can we infer what it might be susceptible to in terms of antibiotics? Do you know how it replicates? What metabolic output does it have? Can we say anything about the niche it lives in? Is it free living or symbiotic? So we could kind of start gaining insight into what a microbe is in this case, just by knowing where it falls in the tree of life. And this is just one of many things in our toolkit that we can use to better inform culturing recalcitrant microbes, right? So the great plate anomaly. We don't know how to grow and culture many microbes, and phylogenetics is used at least as one of those tools to help us figure out what can we do to make those organisms grow, given what where that organism falls in proximity to others, right? So we might get some insight that, hey, this microbe likes to grow in this environment. 
because, or we think that's the case, because it's a sister taxa to this other microbe we already have information about. Okay, hopefully that was a nice little uh, history lesson on the history of phylogenetics and sequencing and how it's evolved over time into the current state. Now in Chime, we offer a couple of ways of building and constructing phylogenies. One of them is a de novo approach, meaning we just take the data itself, we generate alignment, we do things to that alignment, and we build the tree from that alignment. Another approach is you can take a well-curated reference tree in alignment and insert your sequences into that tree. And this is very helpful when you are um, generating short sequences, as is commonly done with amplicon sequencing, and you want to try to extract as much phylogenetic information out of that as possible. And you can build a tree that way. We'll go through and compare both of these approaches, and hopefully you'll have better insight into what is the best way to analyze your data. Now, here's a listing of the common commands you might use for this section of the workshop. You have the alignment plugin where you can make a de novo alignment with math. You can mask that alignment. After which, you can build the tree. You can um, use one of three algorithms or groups of algorithms Fast Tree, Raxamo, IQ Tree. And within Raxamo IQ Tree, there's a bootstrap version, and we'll discuss bootstrapping in a bit. And then when you're done making that tree, you often have to root that tree. Now, as a convenience, we also provide a pipeline which will carry out the entire process of making the alignment, masking the alignment, building the tree, and then rooting it for you, and capturing the outputs of each step along the way. And then we'll end on talking about fragment insertion. We'll do that because some of the problems um, that you'll see inherent in doing de novo phylogenies are sometimes circumvented by doing this approach. Now, depending on the data you have, you'll have to make the decision of which is a better approach, and we'll discuss those. De novo phylogeny. Now, here's a high-level view. So you import your sequence data, and you've learned, hopefully, about data types by this point. So you have unaligned sequences, which are grouped as the type feature data sequence. You can do a variety of intervening steps, and then you output a tree. Now, we have this tree, and we have the, the tips of the tree, so where your taxa are, or your features, your exact sequence variants, your OTUs, whatever they are. There are the tips of the tree. And you have branch lengths, which often are indic indicative of substitution rates, how many substitutions in the DNA sequence occur. And if you want to know the distance between feature two and feature three, you sum the branch length, this one here and this one here. And if you add these two, you get 1.1. That is the sequence distance between these two features. Now, the vertical line has no meaning other than to show the grouping. So there is no distance associated with the vertical line, only the horizontal lines. Now, these branch lines, we'll get into how they're generated, but it depends on how you're calculating a distance, and there's many ways to do that. You have a node, which uh, we're representing here, but this is also a node. This is also a node. And then you have the root of the tree, and we'll discuss the importance of roots right now. Okay, now many phylogenies, especially likelihood programs, or maximum likelihood programs like Fast Tree, IQ Tree, Rexo, often output what's called an unrooted tree. Another, and an unrooted tree often looks like this. And it doesn't provide a sense of directionality, especially since this is what we're often interested in. And that is how do character states of the things we're looking at change over time? So when it's unrooted, you kind of don't have an inferred directionality of the relationships. Is this the oldest group? Is that the oldest group? Or is it this one? What, I don't know which way to go here. So you have no implied hierarchy. 
Now, if you pick a root, in this case, Nori was chosen as the root, now we have a directionality. We know that this is the root of the tree, and then this is likely the out group, or the maybe often cases, this is uses the most, say, ancient or oldest um, taxa, or relatively older taxa compared to everything else in the tree. So now you can start mapping features onto the tree and track changes over time, and as well as the clustering or the imposed hierarchy of these things. Now this is just kind of a fun way of clustering things. You could probably come up with many other ways in which you'd rather cluster these. Maybe you can change the tree to reflect what your favorite and least favorite items are on this tree and make a tree that way. Okay, now before we get into making a tree, there's some considerations that we should discuss, and that's about homology. Now, homo homologous sequences share a common origin. Now, from there, we have to limit ourselves to the type of common origin they have. So an ortholog are homologous sequences, right? They share an origin, but they have a similar function. Now, likely what this means is that the gene in one organism is the same gene as the other organism. And the only reason why they're different is because those genes exist in different species. Now, you could have a case where you have parallax, where the genes are different, not necessarily, not necessarily because they're in different taxa, but maybe because there was a gene duplication event. So that's what's shown here. You have a gene, that gene gets duplicated to X and X prime, but now the constraints um, of selection and drift are, might differ on this copy compared to this copy, and they will slowly diverge. And these genes may also co-diverge across the species, which is shown here. So there's a gene duplication event, and in this case, regardless of which of the two genes I use, I can reconstruct the species tree. In this case, both of these sections of the tree, the purple and the green, are showing that humans and chimps are more similar to each other than either is to a gorilla. However, there might be a case where either we don't have that information or the gene was lost in that lineage indicated by the dotted lines. So there are cases where we don't have the ability to make a proper tree, whether it be through technical reasons, i.e. we just don't have the data, or the genes were lost. So if I was to make a tree in, by not knowing that, that this was a duplicated gene and went under different evolutionary history than this gene, well, if I build this tree, then this tree is showing that humans and gorillas are more related to chimps. Right? So this is a problem uh, a lot of times when building phylogenies, uh, or initially it was the problem with building phylogenies, is this we had to deal with this issue of differentiating orthologs versus paralogs, and we always want to have orthologs. And that brings me to this idea of discordance. So what I just showed you about making that incorrect tree, because I might have a paralog, that's one way you can have an incorrect tree. The other is not necessarily that the tree is incorrect, but keep in mind that whenever you're making a tree from amplicon sequences, or any sequence, that there can be a discordance, meaning it's just a gene tree. We hope the gene tree follows the actual history of the species itself. So don't be too surprised if you're making a 16S tree or a cytochrome oxidase tree, gene tree, or any other gene tree, that there might be some differences in the topology that you find from the gene sequence versus what is known about the species. And this is kind of given by this example here, where you have three genes, a yellow, a red, and a blue. And each of these Genes has a different history within the species. Again, gene duplication, gene loss. So just as you could have um, species go extinct, you could have genes within a lineage go extinct or diversify, duplicate. 
And here you can see there are, among these three genes, there's three possible topologies, but only one of them, the blue one, matches the species tree. So always keep that in mind uh, when you're building trees, is all you're ever really looking at is the structure of the gene itself. And you hope, uh, generally you pick the gene because it matches the species evolution uh, more directly than others. Okay. Now we're going to talk about de novo alignments. So before we even get to the tree, we have to overcome the issue of making sure we're comparing things correctly. So just as I discussed homologs and paralogs of the whole gene itself, well, we actually have to make sure we're comparing positional homology of the orthologous sequences, meaning just as we have that issue of or orthology and paralogy of, of the whole gene itself, we have to have that discussion with columns of the alignment. How do we know that this alignment is likely the true alignment? So what we're saying here is that the T at this position in this gene is actually the same character T for this position in this other sequence. Here we have a mismatch. Why didn't we add a gap here? Well, we're basically stating that either one of two things, since we don't have a third or fourth or fifth sequence to give us a direction, just like rooting a tree. So just from these two sequences alone, we don't know if the A became a G or did the G become an A. I, either way, the sub, we don't know the order of the substitution that occurred. And there's different rules and criteria and many different ways to kind of derive a sequence alignment. Here is a very uh, traditional approach called dynamic programming. This is kind of uh, the, the method that BLAST and many other tools use. And this is just showing a simple case for two sequences. And there's a lot of parameters and rules that you can apply to this model to dictate, well, what is the criteria I need to insert a gap? What is the criteria I need to extend the gaps? And what is the criteria to allow a mismatch? In other words, this is the crux of the issue. How do you decide that this should be aligned in the same column as a mismatch or whether or not you consider it different enough to insert a gap? And this is a very big problem, especially with very dealing with very ancient sequences that varied a lot. How do you infer these is basically the, the biggest problem with sequence alignments. But just know there's many different programs. MAFT is the one that we'll use here. But there's a lot of different tools with different assumptions about the data and parameters you can change given the type of sequence data you're using here. We're most, today we're mostly talking about DNA sequences, but there's different criteria for amino acid sequences that can be used as well. But the idea is how do we do indels and uh, mismatches? Oh yeah, sorry, indels is an insertion and deletion. So um, what we're discussing here, again, we don't have directionality with these two sequences, but this sequence you could say has a deletion. In other words, it lost a G and a C, so there's no basis there. Or you can say this sequence has an insertion. It gained a G and C. Now, without older or other sequences in this alignment, we don't know which way this occurred, so we just call it an indel. That set of columns in this alignment is just an indel column. Now, there are many ways to reduce ambiguity I won't spend too much time on this, but you could have guide alignments where you have, a, maybe you have a nice curated set of sequence alignments that you want to just simply map your reads to because you trust that alignment. Uh, de novo alignments can sometimes have problems. You might get a slightly different alignment every time you add a new sequence. But if you want to minimize that effect, you could have a reference alignment that you're mapping sequences to. This uh, example here, with our RNA data or uh, other genes where you actually have some sort of secondary structure, you could use that information to guide the alignment. And it actually helps 
you determine whether, or the model determine, whether it should allow mismatches, gaps, or, um, yeah, mismatches or, or indels. So as you can see here, you have sequences here. This side of the molecule has complements to the other side. You could have, in a sense, insert gaps into the alignment because these are loops. So depending on the stem and loop structure and the information you get from that, you could add that to your model to make a better de novo alignment. Well, how is this done? Well, there's many ways. Here's just two. We won't spend too long here, but the idea is you've heard of NAST, nearest alignment space termination, and then CINO, which is the silhouette incremental lineup. But the idea is you can take your query sequence and you can find either a set of sequences that match that query and then use that closest match to help guide the alignment. Great, you have a template that you can map that to. Or you can create a model, and there's many ways to do this. This is the Silva approach. There's others like hidden Markov models that can be used, but you generate a sort of graph or a model of the alignment, and when you insert your new sequence, it tries to follow the set of rules. For example, we have A, G, and then we can either go to G or skip to G and become an A, and that skip G to A basically means there's a gap. Here we can go directly from G to T, or G, C, G, and insertion here. Now, again, there's many ways to do this, but this is a, a way to help guide, especially more problematic sequences that are more difficult to align, and if you have a way to curate uh, those sequences, you can do that as well. Now, after you do an alignment, whether you use a reference-based approach or you're using a de novo, completely de novo approach, like using NAFT, you, there might be issues of the alignment algorithm, or maybe the sequence is just too noisy and you can't construct a great alignment. And it, there's probably concerns about, you know, all these columns really truly homologous positions in the alignment. Are there really things we should be comparing? Now, the approach of applying a mask, often called a lane mask, proposed by David Lane in 1991, is to re help remove these errors where you kind of might introduce more error in making the tree. So you could probably make a better tree by removing these noisy regions of the alignment, simply because you don't really know if those bases in that column should be compared to one another. So you remove them. Also, it's used to remove these phylogenetically uninformative sites. Again, there's many ways of masking. Sometimes you can mask things that are just exactly the same or not. And this depends on model substitution models and whatnot, which we'll get into a little bit uh, in a few minutes. Often, uh, as with amplicon sequencing, as well as genome sequencing, if you have repetitive regions or homopolymeric regions, you might have, say, accession with 10 A's and another sequence with 8 A's. Well, where do you put the gap? They're all the same. And that can matter because other sequences may not have all those A's in that region. So it becomes difficult to know where to introduce the gap or allow a mismatch in that sequence. Or you can have a repetitive sequence. Maybe I have uh, here, I have four TA repeats, but in another sequence I might have eight TA repeats. So where do I put those gaps? It's hard to know. So we just remove them. And you can kind of, uh, removing these helps uh, clean up the phylogeny or hopefully make a better phylogeny. Now, keep in mind, depending on the alignment approach you use, might alter the structure of the alignment and may change how that alignment ends up being masked. I could use one tool to do an alignment and it might give me a different alignment than another tool. And then when I go to mask them, I might be masking out different things. So be cognizant of that. Now there are caveats to masking. Uh, the most common um, arguments against masking are if your mask is too aggressive, you might be removing too much information. And very often you make the sequences more similar to one another, or in some cases, even identical. 
meaning that you're losing some phylogenetic resolution. Now, this may not be important in all cases. If you're only comparing, say, at the community level, this may not be too much of a problem. But if you really care about the actual phylogeny of what you're looking at, then you might be detracting from making use of exact sequence variants because you might have two sequence variants that will become identical after you mask. Now again, that's only important if you're really wanting to look at the actual phylogeny of your exact sequence variants. If you don't really care too much about that and you're just generating a tree for community level comparison, say Unifrac or Faith's phylodiversity or any other phylogeny for metric for the community level, you might be okay. But just keep this in mind um, when you're deciding on how to mask or how aggressive you should be masking. So ultimately, it really depends on the question you're after um, or the question you're hoping to answer. And you should balance out the level of masking or not mask at all. And you can do some iterative runs. You can try making a tree without a mask or you can make it with different levels of masking. So there is no one size fits all, depends on the marker gene that you're using and the question you're after. Okay, now that we sort of kind of got our alignments worked out, the next step is to build a tree. Now, now that we have our alignment and we have hopefully our positions lined up appropriately, you have to now build the tree now, with some of the phylogeny programs included in CHIME, they only have one or two models that you can use. One of the programs that I like to use often is IQ Tree, and it's got a couple hundred models that you can choose from, and it will look at your alignment if you want, assess what the best substitution model is for that given data set, and then build a tree given that model. Now, what is a substitution model? Well, it's about how bases can interchange or substitute from one another. The most simplest model, say the Jukes and Canner 1969 model, shows that any base can equally change to any other base, regardless if it's a transition or a transversion. So what is a transition or transversion? Well, if you remember your uh, basic biology uh, memory tool here, pyrimidine, cytosine, uracil, thiamine, the pie cut, and purine, adenine, guanine, pure as gold. So if you're changing between any of these bases or any of these bases, it's a transition. But if you're changing between bases, transversion. So here you have another model where you have T and Cs equally changing towards each other or A and G towards each side of the other, but less often so between. Here you have a different case where the model is slightly different, where you have T to C, C to T. Here you have A more often going to T than the other way around. Now there's a few hundred models that you can potentially choose from or models that your data may fit. But the idea is once you have an appropriate model or you have one based on some prior knowledge, you then can do bootstrapping. Well, what is bootstrapping? Well, it the name comes from holding yourself up by yourself. You're, you grab your, the bootstraps on your shoes and you hold yourself and you float in the air. <laughs> so basically what you're doing is you're sampling with replacement, meaning you sampling columns of the alignment with replacement which means I can sample the same column more than one time and I create a pseudo data set. And the pseudo data set here is the same length as the original alignment. And from the pseudo data set, I build the tree. And I can do this, when I do this, I often do this a thousand times. So I have a thousand bootstrap data sets and for each of those, you build the tree for each data set, which is why bootstrapping can often take a while. You're inferring hundreds or thousands of trees. And then at the end, you make a consensus tree from this output. And what that means is you are going to come up with a way to quantify how well supported 
the branching pattern or branching structure or sometimes the split structure of the tree. In this case, I assume the 67% is falling here on this branch. So we're, what we're saying here is after this branch or this split, so you could think of splitting this part of the tree from this part of the tree, seek A and seek B appear together among all these permutations 67% of the time, right? Meaning the other, you know, 23 or so percent of the time, you might have seek A and seek C or seek B and seek C or anything like that. All, all that percentage means is these two taxa appear after this split 67% of my pseudo replicates. So no matter where, so when you're looking at these percentages, bootstrap percentages specifically, there are other measures of support for nodes and they might they mean different things but specifically for bootstrapping whenever you see a bootstrap number it's basically saying any and all taxa that appear after that split appear there that percentage of time normally a good support and it can vary depending on who you talk to um, often with bootstrapping usually 70 to 80 percent is, is a pretty good support for that node or that branch, I should say, that split. Um, usually, if it's less than that, you can say, I'm going to collapse this. You get rid of that. And then you can say, I can't resolve the differences between seek A, B, and C. OK. So now you know what kind of happens behind the scenes when you're bootstrapping a tree and you're getting confidence of the nodes of that tree. Now, again, that was all the de novo process. Now, here's an approach called uh, fragment insertion. Here's the paper for it, and if you want to read more about it or the tutorial, you can click on the, the GitHub page for Q2 fragment insertion. So what does this do? Well, let's kind of refer back to our de novo approach. So normally, right, we might have a reference database with full length 16 as sequences. But we're only, in this case, we're going to use the V4 Amplicon region. Now, you could see right away that the amount of phylogenetic information we have is drastically much less than the entire full length of the gene itself. And that can cause some problems. One is here, the red lines are our Amplicon sequences, but only four of which have exact or nearly so representatives or sequences, full length sequences that, that it matched to in the reference database. The rest do not have a, a match or a close match to those in the reference database. And here is the crux of the problem. What do we do with these sequences that don't have a direct match in the reference database? Well, there's three things you can do. You can do a read recruitment where depending on some uh, dissimilarity criteria that you allow, it could be 100%, 99%, 97% similarity, and you only keep those reads that can recruit to the reference data with that sequence similarity threshold you set. However, you end up discarding a lot of real data. So these could be, these aren't necessarily bad sequences or chimeras or anything like that, they could be real, but you're discarding them simply because they don't match well enough to the criteria you set. The other approach, the other uh, end of the spectrum, is you can keep everything. However, just like we discussed about a gene tree not necessarily matching the species tree, a sub-sequence or sub-gene I should, I guess we can call it a subgene, but a subsequence of a larger sequence can also not give us the same tree. A full tree given by the full length sequences is going to give us a different tree than that just based on the amplicon region. Why is that? Well, I could have a case where I have two full length sequences that are extremely different from each other over the full length, but for whatever reason, 
that are nearly identical over this region. So in the de novo tree, it might make those sequences appear more similar to one another than they should be. I could have the opposite case where my full length sequence is almost identical, except for maybe that bit of the V4 region. So now I could be inflating differences. I could have that sequence here and another sequence here. So the issue with doing de novo short reads is you could either over inflate differences or under inflate differences between because really the tree is just reflecting the information content of that small amount of sequence. So what can we do to get around? Neither of these are really ideal when dealing with short reads. So how about we combine the two and do something called an insertion tree, which is combining both of these. So what are we doing? Well, first of all, the best case is we insert something that matches fine. We don't have anything to work out there. The issue is, what do we do with these reads that don't have an exact match? Well, what you can do is you could figure out through an iterative procedure where they fall on the existing tree and insert them appropriately. Well, how is this done? Well, it's done by an approach. This, this is what's going on with the fragment insertion approach. It's, it's taking a technique from de novo alignments called SATE, which is the simultaneous alignment and tree estimation. Now, one thing I didn't tell you before is for very tricky sequence alignments, it's very difficult to know how we should align them before making the tree. So we can really only know the true sequence alignment unless we have the phylogeny. But the problem is we can't get the phylogeny without the alignment. So it's almost can be a case of circular reasoning, but not quite. And again, this is only a problem for, for ancient sequences that are very difficult to align. And there are many other tools out there that do this co-estimation of the alignment and the tree. And it's this iterative process where we have an initial alignment. Some programs will come up with an equally likely set of alignments to come up with an equally likely set of trees and then use that to infer a new set of alignments and so on and so forth. Again, many different ways to do this approach. But the idea is you're kind of trying to leverage both bits of information, or at least as much as you can extract from that. And that's what this simultaneous alignment and tree estimation is doing. Now, the part we're going to discuss more is SEP, which is you're taking this iterative approach to help you better place fragments into a tree. And in a general sense, what we're doing is we're taking subsets of the tree and the corresponding subsets of the alignment to kind of work out where the sequence should go. So let's say, if you look at the tree on the right, here's our base tree. We have a short read, and on our first round through this loop, it inserts the fragment here. Now it's basing that off of a local alignment or its initial round of making a local alignment and, and, making, and only making a subtree. So it's aligning only to part of the tree and it's placing it here. And it goes through an iterative process, and I'm hyper-exaggerating the process here just to make the point, but you can see that, well, through the next process, it might decide to insert over here. And then it goes through the process again, and then it inserts it here. And let's say it goes through a few more rounds of iteration and it doesn't change. This is likely the place it belongs, and now that is where your fragment is inserted. Now, it could easily go the other direction. It could start off here and maybe end up coming off in the more base part of the tree. But that is, in a nutshell, what it's doing. It's an iteratively trying to refine where these fragments go. Now, this is helpful. Now, as you can see here, here's a PCOA plot of your data. And when you do, say, a de novo approach of mapped and fast tree, you can get some artifacts where samples don't necessarily show up where they should. They're showing up together, probably because they're so different. Or, as I said, given the amount of information that short read, right, we could hyperinflate their similarities or their differences. In this case, I'm assuming 
we're hyperinflating their similarities, which is why they're all showing up here, as opposed to the rest of where they should be going, as indicated by the color. And these two other plots are two different test cases where they're using the fragment insertion approach. And you can see, you can kind of recover where these points should fall in your plot. Now we've completed um, our approach here. Oops, I miss, I miss uh, put my, <laughs> my highlighter here. It's supposed to be around data resources. But if you go to the Chime page and you want to make use of the fragment insertion, there's two trees you can make use of. There's one based on Silva 128, another based on Silva 138, and you could insert your trees there. There's other information in the data resources page as well. Check out these two tutorials. Uh, the, well, the current version we're on now is 2020.6, but if they're using a later version, just change that to the current version. And the Q2 fragment insertion tutorial here. And again, if you want to know more information about these tools, just type in the plugin and dash help. And hopefully you've learned a little bit in the general sense of how to do and how to build trees and how to construct phylogenies and all of the caveats you should think about when doing so. So that's it. Um, it was my pleasure to discuss this with you. And I hope all your trees are fully resolved or nearly so. Take care.